first and foremost, I believe that we need a building of our own because I believe it's God's design. I think God has given Metro a very unique situation. There's, there's good churches all over this county. All over the Metro New York area, there's wonderful churches. But Metro seems to fall into this unique niche where we have got a multi-ethnic, multi-generational situation. We have a church that is based on weakness, not on strength, where we encourage people to be transparent with their lives exactly where they are, that God meets us exactly where we are. And I've had conversations with Pastor Peter about this in the past. And one of the things, one of the things he shared with me from his heart was that he doesn't know of another church that's, that's really reaching the segment of the population that Metro is. And he said, I always want there to be space for more people to come who need to be here. The reason that Greco School is not a good solution for us long term is that we have such limited access to it in a given week. And if you think about it, we really have it for about four hours on a Sunday morning. And then for the rest of the week, we're kind of on our own to figure out space to use around the city of Inglewood or office space that we lease. I could easily see us more than doubling the space that we have right now in terms of capacity. No matter what we do, Ultimately, I can see Metro outgrowing it. And that's why Metro is already, we're already having the conversation about that, that very fact, that dynamic. And we have no reason to think that the growth is going to stop at Metro. It hasn't yet since, uh, since its founding 14 years ago. The space that we're using right now at Greco Elementary, while it's, it's great in a number of different uh, aspects, it was never designed to be a church. And if you visit us on a Sunday, you will see that the space we actually meet in for adult worship is a cafeteria. And the cafeteria tables are around, you can, you can see them. The stage that we use for our worship team and for preaching and for dance and for drama is a tiny little triangle in the corner because a cafeteria doesn't need a big stage space. So what we do is we make do with what we have there. Now, we're guests in that building. It's not our building. We can't change the color of the paint. We can't build a larger stage or move the stage or anything like that. We have to just work with what is already there. And so we're very, very limited in how we can use that space. While we're thankful for it, we realize it's temporary and that the day is coming when we're gonna need to have a space of our own where we will be able to design things the way that we need them to be to, to do our teaching for our children, to, to provide space for adults in adult learning situations, for our worship services on Sunday morning. And it'll look very, very different from this, this space that we're in right now. Five or six years ago, when we had completely outgrown the little office space we were using in Fort Lee, New Jersey, Metro came to the conclusion that we were an Englewood church. We've been worshiping here in Englewood for several years, but we'd never had our office here. We didn't have our mailing address here. We had no physical presence during the week here in Englewood. And so we made a decision. We knew we had to move to a different office space, but we made a decision it was going to be in the city limits of Englewood. At first, we rented about half the space that we actually have right now. And we thought that was gonna last us forever because it was so much larger than the space that we left in Fort Lee. But it didn't take us long to realize that now with more space, we were able to expand our ministries. And, and I'm not talking about just ministries within the church, different small groups and men's group and women's groups, they're all meeting in here. Soon we got to the point where we realized that, you know, we were literally bursting at the seams here. We spoke with our landlord. There were still several hundred square feet available in the building and we just told him, we said, sir, we'd like to lease every square foot that you can give us here in this building. And he did that and we rewrote the contract. And so what we have right now is all that was left of the building for us. But once again, we're at this point now where, where people are like in competition for scheduling the space here because like not having our own church building that, that we have access to all week long, 
the little space that we have here is very, very high demand space for us. And so we can easily read the handwriting on the wall and say this can't last much longer. Uh, we either make another move here in Englewood, lease some additional office space somewhere, or we move ahead on what we believe God is calling us to do, to move into a permanent home here. In terms of the difference that this building is going to make for us at Metro, there's dozens of different reasons, but let me, just share, let me just share a couple of them. One that comes to mind right now is the amount of time, effort, and energy that goes into setting up and breaking down at the school every Sunday. A lot of people don't realize it, but we have actually a team that shows up at 7 o'clock in the morning on Sunday to set up classrooms, to set up the worship space, to set up all of our technology so that by 9.30 we can have our first worship service. Now if you can imagine all of that time and effort being translated into the specific ministries, we will also have the ability to add things that we're not able to add there at the school. And what I mean there is, in terms of adult ministries, there's all kinds of things that we want to offer to our adults, but we just can't in the space where we are. Well, this new facility is going to be designed in, in, in such a way that you could have a seminar going on with 50 adults in there, maybe during one of the services. And those adults may attend one worship service and they might go into a seminar, a parenting seminar, or, or a financial seminar, or, or, or any number of things. Uh, that we're not able to offer right now at the school. I think, I think those things in and of themselves will really change the landscape. There's something unique that's going on at Metro and we don't want to limit that because we've run out of space. Metro and uh, good morning to those in the nursery to everyone watching in the online community. Let's give it up for Pastor Kevin giving us that great interview and uh, you know you guys saw my video last week. You know how many takes I had to do? I just don't do well in front of cameras but Ke I know that was the first time probably you only did, did all that in one take but my mom always says Pastor Kevin has got the presence of like the, the President of the United States. She always says he should be like a president because he carries himself so well, so professionally, and he's so articulate in how he speaks. Uh, but thank you so much. Last Sunday, we started this series um, called Beyond the Building, and it's a historical series because we feel more than ever that God is leading our church to do something that's far beyond what we've really fully dreamed of, far beyond, like when I first started this church, I never thought we'd be in Englewood. If I can be honest with you, I thought we'd be in Fort Lee. And... Uh, God just led us here, and he's showing us step by step, year by year, different things that he's kind of leading us as a community, and he's encouraging us to go beyond just ourselves, beyond our safety, and I want to talk about that today, because safety can probably be one of the greatest deterrents from encouraging us to sort of move forward in the things that God may be calling us to do. And uh, as I get older, I, I realize that safety is something that I really, really, that's really important to me. When I was in my teens and I was sort of in my early 20s, man, I love taking risks. I love like crazy like rides. I had a model growing up when I was a teenager. I said, we got to try to live life and taste a little bit of death while we do it. And so like I was even a good skier, but I go down like a double black diamond on the ski slopes because I love the exhilaration of sort of like these life and death kind of situations. I don't know, for some reason, it really excited me. Uh, I, I would do that. And, and I remember even like when I was in my 20s, I jumped out of a plane and I did a skydiving with some friends and I've never done that before. It was on my bucket list to do it. And being able to do that was like such a great Great thing. And for now, I will never do that again. I'm 44 years old. I just don't know why I did that. It was crazy. You know, my son, I used to love roller coasters. I used to ride them all the time. And like, that'd be the reason why I go to amusement parks. And, and uh, now my son, he sometimes says, let's go, let's go on a roller coaster. And I just can't because when I get off of those things, I don't know about you guys, if you're getting older, I have vertigo for like eight to 10 hours. I'm dizzy the whole day. We were in Universal Studios a couple years ago, and we went on one of those Harry Potter roller coasters. I got off of that thing, and I was dizzy the entire night. It was horrible. I don't ever want to feel like that again. And so as I get older, being safe is important. It really is. It's something that I do care about. And I know we all care about that. We care about safety. We live in an area, in a part of a world, where safety is something that we just take for granted, if you will. 
because we live in safety many times. We don't live in a part of the world where we don't know if today's the last day, where there's such upheavals in a society that oftentimes can threaten life, everyday life, that we don't live in a society like that. Safety is a norm. And safety for a lot of us is something that we always look for. And as long as we're safe, we will do it. But I'm here to tell you something, that if you want to live faithfully for God, safety can be one of the greatest hindrances to you growing in your faith in him. And as I get older, I'm realizing how much harder it is for me to take those chances. How much harder it is for me to sort of enter into those places. That when I was younger, I was like, let's do this. But now that I'm older, no, I don't know if I could anymore. And I think there's got to be some healthiness to this. Because I think for those, there are some Christians and they just want to like sort of take risks every single day. They want to just kind of do these things and they want to take these spiritual bungee jumps all the time. And I don't think that's healthy, guys. And I certainly don't think it's healthy for us to be in this extreme where if God calls us to do something that may require some level of risk, that we're going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. And so last Sunday, we launched into the book of Nehemiah. And my hope is that as we look at the book of Nehemiah, sometimes it's really hard to be like Jesus when, you, when we study the life of Jesus, but it was just great. We learned so much. My hope is that we can try to also be sort of like Nehemiah, learn from some of the things that he was able to learn from so that God was able to use him in a way. And he's going to teach us how we can live beyond safety today, how we can get past sort of us sort of wanting to be safe all the time. And last Sunday, we launched this series and we talked about the three key elements to how Nehemiah was able to sort of save a country that he wasn't even born in. He was a foreigner. He grew up in Persia, but yet God had laid a burden on him for Jerusalem even though those were his ancestors and his people. And we talked about how that God had given us a desire to care, that Nehemiah had a desire to care for his community. He wept for his community and he prayed for his community. And God was able to use that as a catalyst to get him going and to get him to sort of get into that place. Today, he's going to teach us how you and I can live beyond safety. Because if we continue to always revert to safety... We're never going to really fully encounter God in a big way. And somebody said this week, and I thought it was great, a safe life is a boring life. And life is not just about you having fun all the time. That's not what it's about. But it is about you having meaning. And there's a purpose to what you're doing every single day of your life. And that, my friends, requires us getting out of our comfort zone and going beyond just safety. All right? So before we get started... I just want to lead us in a time of prayer, and, uh, and then we're going to look at this passage of Scripture. Kind of just give us about 25, 30 seconds of just silence, preparing your heart to receive from God, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Lord, thank you that you give us examples of men and women just like us who were willing to go beyond safety, that they were willing to go above and beyond because they felt a real deep calling and a sense of your presence leading them to do something for you, God. So I pray for all of us in this room, Lord, that as we engage in the book of Nehemiah, that you would help us, wherever it might be in our lives, that you would help us to live beyond safety. And God, that you would encourage us, Lord, to just trust and have deep faith in you so that we can see the Red Sea part, so that we can see the Goliaths being defeated in our own lives, so that we can even see how an uneven battle between hundreds of thousands of people with just 300 people was able to defeat an army like that. And God, even how a young little 13-year-old girl who was a virgin carried the Son of God in her womb, that Mary was willing to go beyond safety. Would you teach us, God, how we can do that, Lord? So I pray, God, that you would just join us, encourage us, stretch us, and show us, God, how we can live our lives to the fullest of how you desire us to live it. So I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, I pray, God, that it will be pleasing unto you. And all of God's people said... Amen. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 11 towards that last sentence, the very last sentence of verse 11. Here's what Nehemiah said. He said, I was a cupbearer to the king. I was a cupbearer to the king. Uh, 
How do we live beyond safety in our lives, right? How do we live beyond safety? The first thing we learn that if we want to live beyond safety, we have to trust that God has put us in a very unique position, all right? If you want to go beyond safety, believe that God has put you in a unique position. Nehemiah declared that he was a cupbearer to the king at the end of the chapter of, of, of chapter one of Nehemiah. And he was saying that because he realized that he was in this unique position. A cupbearer to the king was kind of like a secret service agent. He wouldn't necessarily take a bullet for the king, but he certainly would be willing to drink a wine that was poisoned for the king and, to, and give his life up so that the king wouldn't have to. That position was a very trusted position. A king didn't just select anyone to be his cupbearer. It was one of the most trusted positions that he would appoint somebody to take. So Nehemiah had this position, and he knew that it was a unique position, and he knew that it wasn't just for him to enjoy the lifestyle of the royal palace. He knew it wasn't just for him to wear these nice silk clothing every single day and just enjoy the life as part of the king's upper staff. No, he knew that God had placed him in a very unique position for this time in life, and especially the time of the life of the people of God. Do you realize, uh, remember the book of Esther, it's right after Nehemiah, but when you look at it chronologically, uh, Esther chronologically happens before Nehemiah. Esther was the queen of Persia. She was married to King Artaxerxes' father, which is King Xerxes. All right? I hope you don't get mixed up with the name. But King Xerxes ended up marrying uh, Esther. It's a long story, but I can't go into that. But, uh, and when she was the queen, there was a governor of Persia by the name of Haman. And Haman didn't like the people of God. In fact, he hated them so much that he convinced the king to order a decree to kill every Israelite in the Persian Empire. It was a genocide of epic proportions. And Mordecai, who was a relative of Esther, said, hey, Esther, um, you're the queen. You got to talk to the king for us. And she's like, I'm too scared to. I can't do that. If I go without him inviting me, I can die. And he says, do you think you're going to escape this? Do you think your family's going to escape this? And he says to her, who knows, but maybe you've been put in this royal position for such a time as this. Do you guys remember that? Who knows, maybe God has put you in this royal position for such a time as this. Who knows today that maybe God has put you in the position of where you are in your family to bring a deeper level of unity and reconciliation because maybe it's fragmented and broken and marred right now with anger, hostility, and hurt and pains. Maybe God has positioned you in a very unique position to do that. Who knows, maybe God has placed you in a unique position, even in your marriage, as broken as it might be today, that he's encouraging you to step up, knowing that he's placed you in a unique position to love and to serve your spouse so that you can build greater, deeper unity. Who cares about the years that you have of history that may not be very good, but maybe who knows that God has placed you in this unique position today to make you to believe that your best days with your spouse are ahead of you, not behind you. Who knows that maybe God has put you in that unique position who knows, maybe God has put you in that unique position at a company. Maybe he's put you there so that you don't just do well and advance and work, work, work up that corporate ladder. But who knows, maybe God has put you in that unique position because there are people that come in every single day that you see and say hi to and their lives are absolutely lost. Who knows, maybe God has placed you there to impact their lives with his love, with no strings attached. Who knows? Maybe God has placed you in this unique position. I was like that about 20 years ago, that I was at Fuller learning to be a pastor. I, I was a second career. I worked, in, I worked in the marketplace before I went into seminary. And I was there, and uh, it was a very unique season of my life because God sort of gave me this vision for our church. And when he gave me the vision for this church, basically, I mean, Kevin talked a little bit about it. But I said, what would it look like if we can be a community where we come together, what brings us together is our pain not our strengths, but our weaknesses. I said, that would be pretty amazing and dramatic. It would be crazy if God brought people here. And, and you know, when we live in a world today where everything is about strength, we connect with people based upon strengths. We work at places by, explo by exploiting our strengths so that people can hire us. Strength is in the world in which you and I live in. And when I started to study the word of God and started to kind of go into it and started learning some things in different classes, I said, what would it look like if what brings us together is our pain? and our weaknesses. I said, that would be a crazy community if that could happen. And I remember just kind of sharing this with a couple of different professors and things like that, and a couple of my friends and colleagues, and they said, well, you can do that, but it's never gonna be a big church. If you wanna grow a church, it's gotta be homogenous. 
Because I said, no, I feel like God's going to call and bring the nations together. And it's been amazing in the past 14 years that God has called people from all walks of different life to come and be a part of this church. Do you know that we have anywhere between 30 to 35 different countries represented in this church? How amazing that is. Do you realize that we have folks from all different spectrums of socioeconomic class, which is amazing? Do you realize if you study sociology, that's even harder than people to get together ethnically when people are from different, demo, uh, sort of, or different range of socioeconomic class? And that we have people in our church doing that. We got folks committed and being in relationships with folks from all different types of socioeconomic class. You know the thing that's really surprised me is that God's bring such a rich diversity of age here in this church, generations. And I'm not talking about the little kids and the youth group kids. I mean, that's all amazing and great. I expected that. But you know what's really been shocking me? That God's brought people like moms, grandparents. Like we started this church, our slogan was, this ain't your mama's church. Right, some of our folks said, man, that stinks. My mom can't come here. I said, no, it's just a hyperbole. But what's been really interesting is that God's brought people here, grandparents, people like my mom's age, where English is their second language, but they come. Why has this all happened? Because our commonality is our pain. Pain shows no discrimination on what color skin you have. We all go through it. It doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. We can all relate to our weaknesses and our pain. Amen? And so God's brought this community together like this, and God's been blessing our church, and we've been able to get to a place now in our church where Kevin talked about in his video that we are just beyond sort of our capacity to do ministry at full capacity here at Metro. And God is leading us in that way, and he's trusting, and he's in placing between us, wanting us to believe that he has put us in this unique position where we're probably one of the most rarest churches around in the entire country, that God has put us in this very unique position for such a time as this. That he's calling us to come together as a congregation where our unity is expressed so deeply in our diversity, right? Because you cannot have one, oneness unless there's diversity. Right? Richard Twist, a famous doctor, an American Indian theologian, he said that unity cannot exist apart from diversity. That's why God is one, because he is three. I was so, when I heard that, I just said, that's deep. There's power in showing the world that there can be oneness in the midst of our diversity. And God has placed us in this unique position to go above and beyond safety and to trust in him and to believe that he's guiding us and leading us as a church to continue to move forward and to continue to do, continue to do the things that he's calling us to do as a church. I don't got to keep telling you about kind of where we are at maximum capacity within our services here, youth group room, the kids, but also the city desperately needs us at this moment in time for us to come together and realize that we've been positioned in a very unique position so that we can serve this community in a deeper way. I shared with you the statistics last Sunday. Juvenile crime here is huge in Englewood. We send the highest number of young teenagers to detention centers. It's not because they're bad kids. It's because they lack the kind of relationships that's needed for them to connect deeply and to do things that can be more helpful to them. Eighth graders don't pass their park scores. My kids just took their park. 61% of eighth graders are failing in their English language arts. They don't meet the requirements in their park state scores to go into high school. 61%. 87% of eighth graders struggle with that in math. And these are smart and bright kids. You really have to trust me on that. Their future lawyers, doctors, their future, you know, future political leaders here in our community, they're, they're amazing kids. What they lack is just deeper, healthier relationships with some folks. This school system, um, Englewood has some of the best teachers. I've been able to sit down. Some of you go teach in this school. We have some great folks here that's working with these kids, but they need something even more so. They need help, and God has positioned our church to do that. And so we're excited about the position that God has called us to be and called us to do and called us to sort of fulfill within the stage of our church's life today. And my hope is that you would see that, that maybe God has placed you in this unique position where you are right now to help us to move forward so that we can live beyond just safety and that we can have a place where a metro community church can call home. Amen? Amen? God is calling us to do that. The second thing we learn now we can go beyond safety is that we live beyond safety when we will trust that God wants us to take a risk. God wants us to take a risk. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 
In the, month of, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, please understand that there's, there's a party going on right now. All right, that month of Nisan is like a party time. Uh, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in this presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king doesn't really concern themselves with their servants. Meaning, if you were a servant of the king and you had a bad day, you had to look like you were having a good day. You were not allowed to be sad, especially during a party. There was a party going on. Here is wine being brought to the king, and Nehemiah is looking real sad. He took a real risk. But you know what Nehemiah was? He was a party pooper. Do you guys know what a party pooper is? You're having a party, and there's somebody there that kind of ruins the whole party for you, right? And I feel like sometimes I can be like a party pooper. I'm sorry, you know, like sometimes I go into like, you know, people's homes, and they're having a party, and I walk in, I automatically see, oh, my God, the pastor is here. We got to be careful. We had a Zamele uh, spring celebration at a, at a beautiful, beautiful hall area in Edgewater. And uh, there was a lot of, there was about 95 to 100 people there. And I came late because my daughter's birthday was that day. So we had a party for her at the house. I came really late. And so I walked in. I, I, I saw a bunch of people from my church. And I remember they were holding their drinks and they saw them. They're like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I don't want to be a party pooper, guys. Have fun. Do your thing. Just don't get drunk, but have fun. But you know, like, you know who a professional party pooper is? My mom. <laughs> My mom is like a professional at it. We took her to Cancun with us a few weeks ago, and we went to an all-inclusive resort. Fantastic place. Like, everything is free. Food is free. Drinks are free. I was at dinner, and I ordered a glass of wine. And she looks at me, and she says, why are you drinking? I said, well, I want to enjoy a glass of wine. She says, you're a pastor, you should not drink. And that kind of got me angry because I just, I'm sick and tired of hearing that. And so I drank the whole thing and I ordered another one. <laughs> and you know what she said to me? She said, are you an alcoholic? I said, no, I'm not. She said, Peter, you're a pastor. Jesus didn't drink wine. And I said, no, he did drink wine. And she said, you know what she said? She said, it's because there was no clean water back then. And that's why they drank wine. I mean, the excuse she's throwing out. And I said, I beg to differ, Mom. I studied it. And you know what this woman did? She woke up the next morning. I don't know what time she woke up. She didn't bring her Bible with her. So my wife brought hers. It was a Korean um, uh, English Bible. She spent hours looking for a verse in Proverbs where it says, do not drink wine. Right? She spent hours on it. And she found it. She finally, when I woke up, she said, get over here. Read this. And I said, Mom, it says, do not drink wine and do not get drunk. I said, it's about not getting drunk. I mean, party pooper. It's the beginning of the trip. Professional party pooper. Right? Had a while. I couldn't even drink a margarita in peace. She kept saying stuff as a result of it. Nehemiah was a party pooper. There was a party going on. The king was throwing it. Your servants had to look good. And Nehemiah took a tremendous amount of risk. You guys need to know this. A risk where if the king was having a bad day, he could not only remove him of his title as a, as a cupbearer to the king, which is a privileged position, but he could have also sentenced him to prison, or even worse, he could have ordered that he would be killed. That's how, that's how much of a risk Nehemiah took. He took even a greater risk. You know what else he did? He indicted the king that he was not doing a good job in caring for his kingdom. Because Jerusalem and Israel was, Judah was under his kingship. And he said, how can I be happy when my ancestor's house, uh, my ancestor's country in which you oversee lies in ruins. The dude was just so honest and so transparent and so real, but he was willing to take this risk because it wasn't a human risk, Metro. It was a godly risk that God was calling him to take. You see, sometimes I know there are people who just love taking risks all the time, and I call those perhaps human risks. God might be involved in that. He might or he might not be. But God encourages us at some point in our lives to take godly risks. So what are some of the godly risks that he's calling you to take today? Are you sensitive to those godly risks? Because if you don't and you sort of revert to your safety, 
you're never gonna really grow. It's gonna be a tough life for you that God is encouraging you to take those risks for him. The leadership of this church, the pastoral staff and the leadership team, we're taking a risk in doing this capital campaign beyond the building. We are. We're taking a risk because we're encouraging our community that on June 3rd is the big day for us as a church. We're going to come together. We're going to have a service and then we're going to have good food afterwards. But we're going to come together and we're going to pray. We're going to hope and that you've seasoned this last several weeks in prayer and then we're going to come together and we're going to pledge, a three-year pledge for the next three years of how much we can give above and beyond our normal tithes to this building campaign. And then we're also going to encourage you to bring your first fruits offering on that Sunday and say, here's my first fruit offerings that's going to this three-year pledge in which I'm going to commit to in giving to this church. That's a risk that we're taking. It really is. It's a risk. You need to know that because some of you I know, you may just be like, well, I'm sick and tired of being a part of churches because you've been a part of a lot of churches where they've always talked about buildings. It's a risk. It's a risk because I've heard horrible stories, honestly, of churches really dividing because of this. Churches break up as a result of it. I've heard terrible stories of pastors leaving the ministry because they've done the capital campaign and it it was too much. They burnt down and they walked away from the church in a few years. It's a risk. But you know what else I've heard? I've heard a lot more stories of churches when they have taken that risk and God has used that to unify the church and God has used that to build the church and continue to do the kind of ministries that God is calling churches to take. It's a risk. I know it's a risk. But God is calling us to take it because it's the risk that he wants us to take as a church. Amen? Amen. He's calling us as a community to work, to move forward the way Nehemiah did, to take those risks because we're going to be a threat to the establishment here in Englewood. You need to know that. The risk is big. We will be a threat to the establishment here in Englewood. It's going to happen. It's going to be a risk, but God is encouraging us to do that. We are putting our money where our mouth is, that if God is continuing to call us to be a church where our vision is transformation, where we experience that as we lean on our weaknesses so that God's perfect strength can be perfected in us, we're putting our money where our mouth is, that if God is leading us, then we are doing this, and we don't want to just be a country club metro. Because we can just say, well, let's just stay here in Greco for the rest of the history of this church. Yeah, we could do that. But do you realize that we're at the the mercy of the Board of Ed here? That at any point they can just say, you know what, we don't want you to be here anymore. You got to leave and we have to leave. But, you know, if we just say, let's just stay here, who cares if we're full, whatever, let's just do it. We could, but then we're just going to be a country club metro. We're not going to be able to fulfill the things that God is calling us to fulfill as a church. And so God is encouraging us the way he encouraged Nehemiah to take a risk, to show us that we've been put in this unique position. And the third, we live beyond safety when we will trust that God has put his burden in our hearts. That's another way. When God has put his burden in your heart, you can take a risk. Look what it says in verse 4. Then I pray to the God of heaven, and I answer the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Nehemiah, after he heard from Hadani what was going on in Jerusalem, before he went to the king, he sat and he prayed and fasted for four months, guys. That's a long time. For four months, he had prayed, and as he was praying, as he was fasting, and asking God to give him strength and to help him, he was, God was giving him a greater burden. Really, he was giving him a greater burden for the people of God. And so as a result of it, we see that Nehemiah goes. And because he's got such a great burden, he's taking this tremendous risk. And he's going to the king and he's making these crazy demands that we're going to look at later. But he has the burden of God in his heart. Do you have the burden of God in your heart? Do you, Metro? Do you carry God's burden in your heart today? You see, do you know what God's heart gets burdened over? The greatest burdens of God's heart, when you look at the Bible, are really two things. Lost people and people who are experiencing injustice and as a result they're living in either poverty or deep oppression as a result of it. Those are the two greatest burdens that God has in his heart. Nehemiah had that. Nehemiah realized that God's people were being oppressed Nehemiah knew that God had a tremendous heart for the lost, and as a result of that, he started to grow. God, he started to receive the burden that God had given to him. And that's the beautiful thing about this. And I guess the, the challenge for us is this, do we have a heart for the lost? Do we have a heart for those who are hurting today? Do we have a heart? You see, it's really interesting when you think about burdens. 
When we think about burden, when we think about our prayer life, think about your prayer life for a second. It's really so myopic many times because so many of us, we want God to have the burden that we carry in our hearts, don't we? We pray about it all the time, that God, I have all these burdens that I'm going through right now, and God, would you have a burden for it in your own heart? And I, I don't think that's a wrong thing, but how many times do we approach God in that way? How about we actually approach God in a way where we say, God, I want to have your burden in my heart. You see, that's the secret to us growing and understanding the depth of what God wants to do in your life and my life. And God wants you to carry his burden today. He's asking us as a church, because he's put us in this unique position, and because there's some people in this church, a lot of people that are willing to take a risk, will you carry his burden? Will you receive it and carry his burden for the lost and for hurting people today? Will you carry that burden today? Because if we can, oh my goodness, God's going to do some amazing things in our community as a result of it, that he truly will. And let me tell you right now, our church, our leaders of this church, our leadership team, our pastors, we, we have a big burden for this. God continues to bring lost people to this church. I don't know why he does, but every week God brings people who are lost. And at the place and rate we're going now, we're not going to be able to welcome any more into this place. We have to have a burden for that. We have to have a burden for the lost people here in Englewood, especially the statistics that I read that there are children, there are people here that are experiencing hardships in life because there are things going on here that we have to fight and stand against, that we have to have a heart for justice, that we have to have a great burden for it. And God is leading us as a community to do that. Will we be like Nehemiah and have that kind of great burden? Nehemiah, it's only, the only way it's going to happen is through prayer, Metro. That as we pray together and fast as a community, so please sign up for that 40 days of fasting and praying. By the way, I just kind of thank you guys for signing up for that. I looked at the list this week, and man, there's like 15 people a day that signed up for praying and fasting for this. That's the only way. The only way you're going to get God's burden and receive the burden that God has on his heart is when you pray and say, God, what is burdening your heart today? And so can you pray? Join us in prayer and receive the burden that God wants to give you for this church, and for even the city here in Englewood. Fourth, we, build, we live beyond safety when we will trust that God will grant us great favor. All right? God's going to give us great favor. Why? Because we carry his burden. Because we carry his burden. Look at verse 6. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? I pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request, so I went to the governor of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letter. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. Nehemiah carried the burden of God, and so he knew that God was going to grant him not just some favor, but great favor, right? Great favor. And he asked the king for everything. He says, can I get a letter so that I can get safe passageway to, through the trans-Euphrates? You know who ran that area? It was Sam, Samballot, who was the governor of Samaria. And you're going to read as we go on into the series in Nehemiah, Sambala, Tobiah, and Geshem tried to stop what God was trying to do in, 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 in Judah, in, in the city of God, that they were trying to do that. And so Nehemiah was smart. He said, can you give me a letter? And that letter, when Sambala saw it, there's nothing he could have done. Because if he would deny Nehemiah a safe passageway to Judah, then he would be denying the king and he would get in trouble. And so he allowed him to do it. But then, I mean, he went for it. He said, can I also get like another letter so that I can get all the free timber and resources that I need to rebuild the city? And the king said yes. Not only that, the king gave him an army to protect him so that he can get there safely. Man, that's God's favor. It's not just some favor. It's great favor. I don't know about you, but I want to constantly be living in God's great favor. Don't you want to live in God's great favor? Great favor. Because you don't want to live in his disfavor. 
You want to live under God's great favor. And, and a lot of us, when we think about God's favor, a lot of us, we think of it in a very myopic way. We think of it as just, you know, God bless us, bless our home, bless our children, bless our family, uh, so that, you know, we can just continue to, to live our life well. You know, we pray for certain things, that our kids will go to good schools and different things, that God will bless our careers. And, and I'm not saying that that's not God's favor. I think it's really ancillary. But when you look at the Bible, you realize that God's favor always was deeply connected to us having his burden in our hearts. Meaning if God was going to pour you out his favor, you got to go and do something for God pretty amazing and spectacularly. That God was calling you and I to do that. So favor, living in God's favor, literally what it means is not just so that your life can be blessed. God's favor is there so that you can carry out his burden, the purpose that he wants you to live out so that lost people can be found. So that people who are experiencing injustice can experience some justice. That's how we live in God's great favor. That's why when Moses was just kind of hanging out as a fugitive, God says, I want you now to go back to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him to let my people go. All right? And Moses was saying, no, 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 I can't do that, God. I just can't. It's just too hard. I can't even speak well. I've got a speech impediment. And God says, I'm going to grant you great favor. You need to have that burden. He says, you had a burden in your heart once before, Moses, but you used it to kill somebody. That's not what I'm going to have you do. If you carry this burden the right way, I'm going to lead you. You're going to see my favor. And he did. The whole people of God left. The Red Sea was parted. It was beautiful. I talked about David and Goliath too. David with his little boys just bringing lunches to his brothers because his fathers had to do that. They were in war. And everyone was so scared because there was this Goliath. He, was this, he made Shaq look like, like a tiny man. This guy was huge and strong. And David said, how dare this guy defy God? And he says, I will do it. He carried God's burden, and God showed him great favor. We can just go on and on. Gideon with his army from, from tens of thousands to 300 to go up against an army of 150,000. A 13-year-old little girl carrying the baby of God in her room. If you carry out God's burden, you will carry out and you will experience God's great favor it's just a blessing. You know, I, I believe there's tremendous favor that God is pouring upon our church. You know how I know that? There, there are a lot of reasons, but there are three things that I want to share with you. Number one, God just keeps bringing lost people to our church. God just continues to do that. It's God's favor. It's not us. It's not what we do here. But it's just God's favor upon our church. And we're just so grateful and thankful for that. That he continues to grow our church in that way. And we're thankful for that. You know the second thing, how I know where God's pouring favor upon our church? which is really amazing, the city is really connecting with us well. Pastor Anita had a, a, a town hall meeting a couple weeks ago, and uh, the three mayor candidates were there. And you know, uh, this first service, this is the year of the election. We're going to elect a new mayor for the city. The three mayor candidates came to that town hall meeting, and one of them was at first service today. His name is Michael Wilds. He just came through our doors. He's like, hey, what's up? And I had a chance to just talk with him a little bit. But he was at that meeting, and Sunita was getting ready to share a little bit about what Metro Community Church and Metro Community Center wanted to do. And you know what happened? These people in the community, they weren't affiliated with that church. They told these three candidates, you guys have to be on board with what Metro wants to do. You have to be on board with them wanting to build this community center. Sunita didn't tell them to say this. They just naturally, on our behalf, told these three candidates that you got to be open to what Metro Community Church wants to do here in Englewood. That's God's favor, guys. We didn't ask them to do this. They're doing it for us. That's God. You've got to see that. It's God's favor. And then the last thing I would say, one of the last things, or one of many things I think where God's favor is upon us, our staff, we really like each other. <laughs> we really love each other. There's 19 of us, and uh, we have a retreat coming up next week, a staff retreat. And it's like the highlight of, of our staff's year. We get together, we hang out from Thursday to Saturday. We eat some of the most amazing food from Chef Betty Hosang. <laughs> we do life, and there's unity in staff. And listen, you may not know this, because maybe you've never been on church staff before, but you know what it's like even in your own companies. But you know, Kevin always reminds our staff, because he's been through a few in his lifetime, and he says, you guys have no idea how blessed we are as a church. And as a staff that we actually love each other and we like being and working and serving God together. It's a very rare thing in churches today. God's favor is upon us. He's placed his burden in our hearts. Are we going to take a risk and go beyond safety and trust in him? 
That's our challenge, Metro. Will we trust in God because of it? Fifth and last thing, we live beyond safety when we will trust that God will protect us from opposition. He will. He'll protect us from opposition. Verse 10, when Sembalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. When we do what God has called us to do, there will be opposition. Always, always be opposition. But know that God is going to be there with us the way he was with Nehemiah. And we know how Nehemiah ends. You know how Nehemiah ends? God wins at the end, no matter what opposition there is. And you and I need to know that there is an an opposition that we have to face, who is Satan. And he will do whatever he can to destroy what we're trying to do here in this church. Do you know that still the most divided hour of the day during the week is Sunday morning at 11 o'clock? It's still the most divided time in our country. And so what happens here every Sunday is something that's so unique because people from all walks of life come together. And we're united in God in a deep way. And so the enemy will do whatever he can to oppose that. This city will do, I think, eventually, because we're a threat to the establishment, they will oppose what we're trying to do. Building a community center, they will oppose it. We're a threat to the establishment. It's going to happen. But understand this. God will win in the end. He's with those who carry his burden. He pours his favor upon them. And part of that favor is protecting us from the opposition. But can I just speak to you one moment here before we end? Sometimes the opposition doesn't come from the outside. It comes from within. And I want you to be real cautious right now and be discerning because you all love Jesus and that's an amazing thing. I'm not saying if you have concerns, if you have questions, that's fine, absolutely. That's fine. If you have concerns, if you have even maybe some issues, then let's get together and let's talk about it. Let's really share our hearts with each other. Come out to some of the vision meetings that we're going to have in May and June. Come out to those things. I mean, in May, not June. But let's talk about this. But if you are here and you are trying to oppose what God has given the burden for the leadership of this church's heart and the people of this church's heart, and you try to oppose it, I'm telling you, you're not submitting yourself under the authority of God. You're submitting yourself under another authority. And God will use you to divide things. And understand, when there's division, that's not, God doesn't create division. There's unity here. And so questions, concerns, all those are valid. You need to have those, and I get it. But if you're trying to do something and you're trying to create something against what God is trying to do here in this church, especially during this campaign, then you're not working with an authority that God, that's from God. It's a different kind of an authority. And we know at the end, God will always win. No matter what happens, God will always win. It's not about our church winning. It's none of that stuff. It's about God. Carry his burden today. Know that he's calling all of us to take a risk. He's put us in this unique position. And as you carry his burden, may you live under this great favor that God wants to pour upon your life and my life. You know, we started this church with 11 people, and it was real. It was real small. We, we started back in 2004. We launched in April of 2004, but January we had a preview service. And I've talked about this before. And it was just a, a preview service where we were so excited. We were so small to have a church every Sunday, so we, we decided to have church once a month where we would put all of our resources together, all 11 of us, and we'd do the best we can and, uh, and have service. And we'd invite as many people as we can, and we just said, hey, this is what our church is going to look like when we finally launch in April, so you can get a little preview. Maybe you can make a decision if you want to be a part of this or not. And so January was our first preview service of 2004, and so we were really excited. We started planning for this for months. But that Saturday night, there was, it was snowing. And, uh, and I just, I firmly believed that uh, if there was going to be snow, nobody would come out to this thing. And so I stayed up all night and I prayed that God would stop the snow. And the most annoying thing about all of it is that the more I prayed, the more it snowed. And I said to myself, I said, God, why don't you hear my prayers? You ever feel like that? God, why don't you ever hear my prayers? I said, God, come on, stop the snow. No one's going to come out. You see, God was doing something much deeper and wanted to teach me something much deeper than just answer a prayer request of mine. And so it was discouraging. And in the morning, there was a lot of, like, uh, sleet. It was really, like, you know, cold rain, and things were even more worse. The roads were worse. It was slippery and stuff. And so I just said, all right, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to uh, do my best. But I was defeated. 
I walked into the Fort Lee Athletic Club, and it's not, no longer there anymore, and I was shocked to see 11 people serving God with such joy and passion. They were giving it all. They were laughing. They were excited. And I remember just thinking, do you realize it's still snowing, guys? Why are you so excited? I went downstairs to, our, the, to where Shirley was having Metro Kids, and she was transforming the bar into a children's sanctuary the excitement that they all had. And I sat down with them and I just said, I need you to forgive me, guys. I really do. Because I didn't have the kind of faith that you have today. That I was so discouraged walking into this room because of this weather. And I asked them to forgive me. And I said, no matter what happens, even if it's just 11 of us worshiping today, God is going to move no matter what. So thank you. And I said, thank you for teaching me this. God did amazing things that day. People connected with God in a real powerful way. And God brought 67 people to our church that Sunday, even in the snow. Because what was God trying to teach us? Peter, it's not the weather that's going to prevent people from coming to this church. I'm going to send people no matter what. Nothing is going to stop me from doing what I want to fulfill in the life of this church. Those 11 people, they knew that God had put them in a unique position. They knew that God wanted them to take a risk. They knew that God had put his burden in their hearts and that they would live in his great favor. And no matter what happens, even if there was snow, that God would protect them from anything that would stand opposed to what this church was called to be. They knew it more than me. We have about 550 adults that come out every Sunday. Those 11 knew it. And I'm challenging us today, will you? Will you believe today in your heart that God has placed us in a very unique position? That God wants us to take a risk. That God has placed his burden on our hearts. And that he will grant us great favor as we do this. And that no matter what, he will protect us from any opposition. Because in the end, our God is going to win. Our God is going to win. But we trust that as we go beyond safety in our own lives and the life of this church, that we'll continue to see the amazing things that God wants to continue to do. And Metro Community Church, I stand here before you and I declare that our best days as a church are not behind us. They are still ahead of us. But we have to go beyond safety in order to do that. Let's pray.